in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power. Heavenly Father, we just thank you that you are here in this sanctuary with us. Uh, I just pray that your presence is felt by everyone powerfully, Lord. I, I pray that we can uh, discard all that, that stuff that we've gathered during the week that fills our heart and mind, uh, that hinders our uh, ability to worship you and praise you. And, uh, and I, I just pray that that's swept aside and your spirit fills us. And uh, we pray, uh, praise and worship you as you deserve. Thank you again for this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Happy Father's Day. If you're able, please stand and join us as we begin our time of worship and song. sang last week for Avertory, Leaning on the Everlasting Arms, and I love that hymn, and I don't know if you're ever somewhere and you're like, how could I have forgotten that hymn? Like, I sung it all of my life, and I love that song. I was like, we've got to do it this week. So I read a little bit about it, and it was written by a music teacher and who had come across a couple of letters by people who had lost loved ones and um, sent the letters away to a songwriter and said, hey, I think we should put this together because even in times of great sorrow, we have these everlasting arms that we can lean on in times of trouble. And it was based on Deuteronomy 33, 26 to 27. And it says, there is none like the God of Jerusalem. He descends from the heavens in majestic splendor to help you. The eternal God is your refuge and underneath are the everlasting arms. What a fellowship, what a joy 
choose to say But blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your glorious name Blessed be the name of the Lord Blessed be your name, blessed be the name of the Lord, blessed be your glorious name. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, your name is to be praised. You hung the earth on nothing. You bind up the waters in your thick clouds. By your power, you still the sea. The thunder of your power, who can understand? And in your mighty power, you sent us your Holy Spirit, and you sent him to guide and to guard, to convict and to comfort. It is our prayer that your spirit would have freedom in our hearts to move and mold us, to bring us to a greater likeness of God, our Father, for his glory and for his pleasure. Move in us this morning, we pray. God, we just want to give you the freedom to be moving in and through our hearts and our minds this morning. I just pray that as we quiet our, our minds and as we sing this song, that it would be the prayer of our hearts, Father, that the Holy Spirit would fall fresh on us. pray. Dear Heavenly Father, that is our prayer this morning. We are here to be used by you, to glorify you, to be your vessels, to be shaped and to molded. Remove any hindrance in our lives, Lord, that is keeping us from being fully used by you this morning. We just pray that you'll go before this day, this week, our lives, and use us to further your kingdom and bring glory to your name. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we'll continue our worship with our offering. This is a song that uh, Billy Graham used to use in all his crusades, pretty much. Um, 
for people that would hear the word of God and would respond to it. Uh, the name of the song is Just As I Am. It's a really nice gospel song. Just as I am Without one plea But that thou blood Was shed for me And that thou biddest me Come to thee Of Lamb of God I come Just as I am Want not To rid my soul Of one dark blood To these blood Can cleanse each spot Oh, land God, I come I come Just as I am I will receive Will welcome pardon Cleanse, relief, Because that promise I believe oh Lamb God I come I come you come to me Heavenly Father, we do thank you for another day of life and that all we have. Uh, just please help us to remember always that it's uh, directly from you on loan for our time on this earth. Uh, and as we give back, Lord, I just uh, I pray these gifts are, are used to, to make your name known. So people hear the gospel of life, or that they may know to come Jesus as their Lord and Savior, Lord, and uh, uh, have everlasting life in heaven with you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everyone. I will answer all of your questions at this time. Oh, no questions? Good. Uh, no, my wife has gone to Tennessee, so you will not see Beth for the next couple of Sundays. She's in Tennessee with her sister and brother-in-law and their family, and um, Emily's with them as well, so just give you that explanation. Also, I just got word that um, some of you may remember Stephanie's aunt, Lolly, who used to come around every now and then. She just passed away this morning. Uh, she's been struggling with brain cancer for quite a little while, and today uh, she passed away. So um, prayers for the family would be appreciated. Uh, Tammy, who's a part of our congregation, uh, of course, is impacted by that. Uh, let's join together in prayer. We want to pray, pray a prayer to remember Father's Day. How great is the love the Father has poured out on us that we should be called children of God. Heavenly Father, thank you for adopting us into your family, for making us your children. Thank you for being our Heavenly Father 
who loves us unconditionally, cares for us unendingly, and provides for our needs. I thank you for the godly man, man who was my father, who waited patiently and lovingly and raised me to fear you. We pray for fathers. Give them wisdom. Give them patience. Give them the ability to love in a way that reflects your love. We pray for children. Give them guidance. Give them a spirit of obedience. Give them warmth, comfort, and peace in their fathers. We pray for the fatherless, for those who struggled with their fathers and in their families. Be their f- father when their earthly fathered, fathers failed. Uh, show them love and guidance. Help them to know a father's love through your love, providence, and care. Bless all fathers as they care for their families. Give them wisdom and strength and tenderness and patience. Support them in the work they have to do, protecting those who look to them for protection as we look to you for our love and salvation through Jesus Christ, our Lord, our rock, and our defender. This morning we pray for our time together here as we look at your word, for the children in the children's ministry, and for those in the nursery as well, that they would all experience something special from your hand. And Father, today we also want to remember uh, Stephanie's family having lost uh, Lolly. Today we pray for your peace and comfort for all of them. In Jesus' name, amen. We've got a special guest teacher for, what's it called? Community, Community Kids. I gotta, gotta get that in my head. Community Kids, James, who done graduated from college and is gonna teach them kids something or other. So. Kids, children, you're dismissed. So I remember as, uh, when I was a kid, it was the late 60s. And there was a television program on that my mom and dad enjoyed, and so we watched it as a family. I even have watched it since then in reruns. You know, it's one of those things where you watch shows that you grew up watching, and you think, oh, that was interesting. And then you watch it as an adult, and you say, oh, my gosh, that was stupid. (laughs) And this is one of those. Uh, It was called Hogan's Heroes. Uh, See, some of you like it. Hogan's Heroes was the story of some allied prisoners of war in a POW camp in Germany, World War II. And um, they weren't just prisoners of war. They were actually commandos. They were saboteurs who would do whatever they could do to frustrate the German war effort. They would blow up bridges. They would blow up trains. They would blow up convoys, blow up factories. Whatever they could blow up, they blew up. And somehow they always had enough ammunition to blow everything up. And nobody was the wiser, except every now and then the Germans would get suspicious and think, you know, there's a lot of sabotage going on near Stalag 13. That's where they lived. And so they would plant a spy amongst the prisoners. And when a new uh, POW would come into the camp and into their barracks, they would vet them. They would say, hey, where are you from? What's your family? What unit were you attached to when you got shot down and ended up in the POW camp? And you know, all these details, and then they would try as best they could to vet these guys to make sure they were legit, that they were truly uh, allied soldiers, allied prisoners. And, of course, the cliched question was, who won the World Series in 44 or 43 or whatever the time frame was? And so, occasionally, they would reveal that there was an imposter, a phony that had been planted among them. In this study, in our study of the book of 1 John, we'll be continuing to follow this theme of fellowship with God. And the passage today is 1 John 3, uh, 2, rather, 3 through 27. John was establishing some important criteria to determine if we are having fellowship with God. Are we living in fellowship with God? And we're going to unpack some of that criteria today we'll do, to determine if these people were truly Christ followers and living in fellowship with God. And that was important for them because they were, if you remember last week, we talked about the fact that they had been exposed to this false belief system called Gnosticism. And Gnosticism had infiltrated the ranks of the early church. And it was important for John to give this criteria to stand up against this, this uh, heresy, this false teaching called Gnosticism. And uh, that's what he was trying to do. And so ba- basically John was saying this. 
he was saying, my projector doesn't work. No, there it is. <laughs> he was saying, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and have fellowship with God, this is what your life will look like. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you have fellowship with God, this is what your life will look like. And so the first thing we see is the ethic of fellowship with God. And that's obedience to God reflected in love for God and for others. So the ethic of fellowship starts with obedience to God and reflected in love. 1 John chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. We know that we have come to know him if we keep his commands. Whoever says, I know him, but does not do what he commands is a liar, and the truth is not in him, in that person. But if anyone obeys his word, love for God is truly made complete in him. Notice that John begins by using this word, no, which is the same word that the Gnostics were using. The, the Greek word gnosis is the word for knowledge. And so they were using this same word. Uh, and of course, the Gnostics were using it to talk about their special knowledge or special wisdom. And John was using it to describe knowledge of the living God. And so he was using that to kind of counter their expression. For John, knowing God meant having fellowship with God. And that has ethical implications for our lives. In other words, we can't say we have fellowship with God and live however we want to live. We talked about that last week, that there was a group of the Gnostics who believed in licentiousness. They believed you could live however you want and still have a relationship with God. And I used that illustration of the woman who had called me years ago and told me she was committing adultery and she thought God was fine with that. And... Um, over my strenuous objection, she continued to live that way, unfortunately. But that's, that's uh, John says, people who claim that, if you claim to have fellowship with God and then live in a, an ungodly way, a way that's contrary to God's word, then, then you're a liar. That's how he says it. He also indicated this inextricable link between love and obedience. If anyone obeys his word, he says, love for God is made complete in him. In other words, love for God moves forward into being obedient to him. It's an acknowledgement that his commands are for our good. They're not capricious. They're not arbitrary. They're not designed to ruin our lives. They are for our good from our good creator. John R.W. Stott says this. He says, true love for God is expressed in, not in sentimental language or mystical experiences, but in moral obedience. So I love my wife. I love her very much. I believe God blessed me with her. And I say I love you to her every day. I kiss her goodbye in the morning. I give her a hug. And, and, and that's all fine. But if I come home in the afternoon and she says, hey, would you help me with something? I'm going to say, no. I'm not trying to do that. Could you help me with the dishes? I don't think so. I don't see myself doing that. Could you help me take the garbage out? Nope, that's not going to happen. Could you help me load the dishwasher? I don't see that happening either. Am I expressing love? Not at all. I'm being incredibly selfish. Now, just so you know, I've been through the Gary Chapman material of love, love languages. <sighs> Sadly for me, my number one love language is acts of service. So... I'm all over the dishwasher, the trash, the laundry, everything else. I'm all over it like ugly on an ape uh, at our house. So she doesn't have to worry about that. But the idea is here, if, if, if you say you love somebody and, and don't serve them in any way, you've got to ask yourself a question. Am I just giving lip service to this idea of love? Verse 6, he says, whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. That's an impossibly high standard for us. But it's also a reminder that fellowship with God will be manifested not just through adherence to a code. Did Jesus wander through the world thinking, I better obey the Ten Commandments or God won't love me anymore? That's not how he operated. He is in such fellowship with the Father that that wasn't even a question. And so that's the idea that we're moving toward, not just jumping through hoops, but, uh, but having our hearts truly changed, our lives truly changed by the power of the Holy Spirit. And love for God will become more of a natural flow. 
The second part of this ethic of the kingdom is that obedience will be reflected in our love for others. 1 John 2, verses 9 and 10. Anyone who claims to be in the light but hates a brother or sister is still in the darkness. Anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light, and there is nothing in them to make them stumble. So the genuineness of our faith is seen in a right relationship, not just with God, but with people. As we live in the light of the Spirit's leading in our lives, that light becomes brighter so we can see clearly. Think about it this way. If, if you're living in the light and loving someone, even people who might do things that occasionally annoy you, that light allows you to understand what's happening. If you're living in the light, you can say, oh, I, I see the backstory. I understand why that is happening. I, I'm, I'm more clear in it. And I, I, can, I can love them with that kind of love that's based on the fact that I understand what's, what's going on in their lives. But if we walk in the darkness, our default, he says, is to hate. And darkness gets darker so that we can no longer see clearly. We can't discriminate. We can't have objectivity and understand people's motivation. And so as important, it's important for us to love, but also to define love. I think that's always key. We used to joke in seminary about what we called sloppy agape from the Greek word for love, which is agape. And it's not sloppy agape. It's love that's really wants the best for the person you're loving, the object of your love, your concern for them. So that means you don't look the other way if they do something that you think is detrimental. You have the kind of, if you have that kind of relationship where you can say, you know, you're doing this right now and I don't think that's a positive thing for you to do. I want to kind of redirect you to think of a different way to approach that story and that situation. When someone does something questionable and we're saying that we love them, and even though we might not want to confront them because that doesn't seem loving, it's absolutely loving. It's absolutely loving to see that there's someone you love who's making bad choices and you want to help them and redirect them. And so our love for our fellow human beings will be based in truth and a real concern for their well-being, which is why Paul says in Ephesians that we must speak the truth in love. Truth and love are not mutually exclusive. They go together. Speak the truth in love. Think about it this way. If, I'm a, if I have a small child, and many years ago I had small children, and if I would just say, hey kids, I don't want to restrict you or hamper your fun, or do anything that makes you feel like I don't love you. So if you want to go play in the street, that's fine. I just want you to have the freedom to do what you think is best. And I'm not going to tell you no, because you need to have freedom. And you're going to say, I'm calling DCF right now, because you're a bonehead if you're saying that to your kids. You're a knucklehead for doing that because your job as a parent is to protect them. So we don't let our children roam in the streets where they can get hit by a car because we love them. And part of our protective instinct, our part of our goal job is to be protective of them. Love is not indulgent. It's protective because we're protecting our children from harm. Well, I want to go into a just quote a verse it's a couple of verses that are very familiar to us because Jesus as was his custom very well summed up this whole idea of loving God and loving others in Matthew 22 uh, when he said um, love the Lord your God with all your heart with all your soul and with all your mind this is the first and greatest commandment and the second is like it love your neighbor as yourself all the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments And if you think about the Ten Commandments, and I've shared this with you before, if you think about the Ten Commandments, Commandments 1 through 4 are about what? They're about our relationship with God. Then Commandments 5 through 10 are about our relationship with each other. Exodus 20, take a look at them later. You can see that that Pastor Jim's telling you the truth. So 1 through 4 are about our relationship with God, love of the Lord your God. And 5 through 10 are about our relationship with each other. Love your neighbor as yourself. And so Jesus said, he said, the law hangs on these two commandments. 
And that's, I think, what he meant by that. So the ethic of fellowship with God will be our obedience to God, which will be reflected in our love for God and each other. Then there's the evidence of our fellowship with God. So the ethic of the fellowship with God is first. Now it's the evidence of the fellowship with God. And in verses 12 through 14, John wrote about who his audience was. If you can look at 12 through 14, 1 John 2, you'll see. It says that there are people who know God, who are confident of their salvation, people who have God's word living in them, people who have overcome the evil one. So he's, he know, he's building them up and encouraging them and saying, this is who you are. But without as a background, he gives them this very stern warning. He says, do not love the world or anything in the world. If, anything, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. But wait, Pastor Jim. This is my Father's world. He created it. He gave it to us. He gave us the beauty of, of creation, the beauty of this earth. Yes, he did, and we're grateful for that. And this isn't talking about the creation. This is talking about the system, the system in the world that has kind of put itself against God, the system and philosophy of this fallen world that's under the dominion of Satan. And it's people who operate outside of a sense of accountability and understanding of who God is. And so even though we are the people described as as John describes in 12 through 14, hopefully we're in that, that group of people who have overcome and are, are solid in our faith and our conviction of who God is. Still, we're going to be susceptible to temptation and we've got to be aware of that. Love and God, for God and the world are mutually exclusive. And if, if John isn't clear enough in saying that, here, James bludgeons you with it. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world means enmity against God? Therefore, anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. James is not a word mincer. He he comes right straight at you. But we live in a world, and we enjoy the world. It's not all that bad, right? Life is good. And, And yes, but John's challenge for us is to evaluate this world and the allurements of this world in the light of the, uh, God's eternal kingdom. So to have some discrimination, if you will, about that. It's an encouragement to not give in to temptation of the passing wor- world, but to hold on to the unchanging truth of who God is. John listed three things in the world that emerge from the fallen world. The lusts of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. The lust of the flesh is the desire of our fallen world and our own fallen nature, appealing to our baser, carnal instincts to behave in a way that we think will lead to fulfillment. But we find out that it's a huge trap. It's a huge trap, and it's hard to get out of it. And most of us carry around little computers in our pockets or our purses that give us access to something called the Internet, which gives us access to a lot of good things. And a lot of bad things, too. And we've got to be aware of that and vigilant about that because that can, that can happen so fast. I mean, you can see the parodies of people saying, oh, I went to check on this on the website, and what came up is that. Ooh. But that's how it works. And you've got to be vigilant. That's the lust of the flesh. But then he talks about the lust of the eyes. And one author said, that's the tendency to be captivated by the outward show of things without inquiring of their real value, to be captivated by the outward show of things without inquiring of their real value. It's wanting what we don't have and maybe coveting it if others have it. We were kind of joking about that yesterday with the car show and all these interesting cars that were parked out in the field. And some of them were like, I, I wouldn't mind one of those. But I have a different philosophy of cars, I realize that. My philosophy of cars is, I want to be able to get in, it starts, it takes me where I'm going, and I'm done. (laughs) Problem solved. That's all I want in a car. So, maybe I have low expectations. But, 
the conspicuous consumption in our world is really, we see that, that that's the pride of life. When there are some companies that seem to anticipate our desires before the thought even enters our head, and they say, we'll send it to you right away. It'll be on your stoop by 5 o'clock. All the while smiling at us. And making lots of money off of us. There's no delayed gratification in that. You don't think, oh, maybe I'd want that. And you just, you get it. There's no room for contentment in that system. In fact, contentment, if you analyze it and really think carefully about it, contentment is counter to free market economy. So basically, contentment is un-American. Oh, wait. But it's biblical, so there you got a little conundrum for you. And then he says the final thing is the pride of life. That's the trap of comparison. Always looking at others, what they have, and thinking, seeing how they measure up to you or how you measure up to them. One author said the pride of life is an arrogance or vainglory relating to one's external circumstances, whether wealth, rank, or dress. God had a lot to say about that in Jeremiah chapter 23, or 9, 23 through 24. Let not the wise boast of their wisdom, or the strong boast of their strength, or the rich boast of their riches, but let the one who boasts boast about this, that they have the understanding to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. So we are to weigh the values, the allurements of this world in light of our fellowship with God. Verse 17 reminds us of this. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. The world and its desires pass away, but whoever does the will of God lives forever. In other words, the stuff that we want, the pride of of life, the lust of the eyes, all that stuff goes away. But the value of the kingdom endures. And to repeat an old adage that may be a little bit cliched, you never see a hearse pulling a U-Haul trailer. You, You don't get to take it with you. So evidence of fellowship with God will be love and loyalty to God and a resistance to the temptation of this world. The final E, we've looked at the ethic of fellowship with God. We've looked at the evidence of fellowship with God. The final E is endurance of fellowship with God, and that's in verses 24 through 27. As for, me, as for you, see that, you, that what you have heard from the beginning remains in you. If it does, you will remain in the Son and in the Father. And this is what he promised us, eternal life. I am writing these things to you uh, about those who are trying to lead you astray. That would be the Gnostics. As for you, the anointing you receive from him remains in you. And you do not need anyone to teach you. But as, as his anointing teaches you about all things, and as that anointing is real, not counterfeit, just as it is taught you, remain in him. I want you to notice the word that gets repeated four times in these verses. It's the word remain. And it comes from the Greek word, the Greek root meno. And it's a word that John also used in John 15 when he's using the analogy of the vine and branches to tell us about the fact that we need to remain in him or stay connected to him, abide in him is another word, uh, if we plan to live a life that's fruitful. If we're going to live a fruitful life, we have to abide in him. And, of course, we all know, I'm not even necessarily uh, botanically inclined, but I know that you can't just have a branch and expect to get fruit on it. The branch has to be connected to a tree. The branch has to be connected to a root. It has to be connected to a vine in some cases. And so that's the idea. If we're going to endure in our fellowship with God, we have to remain in our relationship with God, not in just in to God, but his word, and to also the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Those are the two things he's talking about that we need to remain in. The word of God, the truth of Holy Scripture, and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Now let's unpack what he means by that. 
First, the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Uh, John R. W. Stott says that Christian theology is anchored not only in certain historical events culminating in the saving career of Jesus. That's an interesting way of putting it, isn't it? The saving career of Jesus. But also to the authoritative apostolic witness to these events. So what he's saying? He's saying it's, it's scripture. It's the witness to what who Jesus was and what he did and the truth of God's working with his people redemptively from start to finish, how he's been involved. So truth is like an anchor that keeps us from drifting away. And we lived in a world where drifting is so easy. Drifting means that Maybe we're looking for something new, a new experience, a new bit of knowledge, a new understanding, and our chronic discontentment kicks in and takes us to places we may not should go because we want these new knowledge and new experiences. Paul uh, tells us about that in in uh, 1 Timothy, I'm sorry, sorry, 2 Timothy 4.3 when he says, for a time will come when people will not put up with sound doctrine. Instead, to suit their own desires, they will gather around them a great number of teachers to say what their itching ears want to hear. There are a lot of itching ears in our world. And and Paul is writing to Timothy a long time ago, but it's like he could have written it this week to us. That's how applicable that is. They, will, they won't put up with sound doctrine anymore. With the clear teaching of God's word, instead, they'll get people to say what they want to hear. Here's what I want you to say to me. That's a dangerous place. It's a dangerous place to get. That's where Gnosticism came from. Because people thought, well, okay, God's word is okay, but I, I want more than that. So to do, endure in our fellowship with God, we must remain in God's word and have it remain in us. By regular ex- exposing ourselves to his word, reading his word, digging in, studying it, journaling about it, really getting in there, rolling your sleeves up and, and just trying to understand what God's saying in his word. He says in verse 27 something interesting. He says, you do not need anyone to teach you. Well, wait a minute. You don't need anyone to teach you? Now, John, I don't think was ruling out human teachers, but he was warning us to discriminate about those human teachers. Gnostic teachers were teaching that the apostolic teaching of Scripture was not enough. It needed to be supplemented with something, and they were offering something that could supplement it, this higher knowledge, quote-unquote. And so John was warning people to, to be careful of what teaching they were being exposed to. The same is our, true in our world today. There's so many people out there teaching so many things. And again, the Internet gives us access to a plethora of stuff. How do we discriminate? How do we know what's legit, what's orthodox, what's okay? And when people ask me that question, I say, well, start with the statement of faith. Go to the website of this person you're interested in. Go to the About Us uh, tab, and you'll drop down a menu, and it'll say Statement of Faith. Click on that and read their Statement of Faith. What are they saying about who God is, about who Jesus Christ is, about who the Holy Spirit is? What are they saying about the inspiration and infallibility of Holy Scripture? What are they saying about those key things? That will give you a sense of whether or not you can trust what they're saying. But, unfortunately, people don't always adhere to their statement of faith. And they get off track. And it's important for us to have a knowledge and understanding of God's word that we can discriminate. We can say, that doesn't line up with what I understand Scripture to be teaching. Because people twist things. They turn them inside out and they make them say what they want them to say. Okay, so we are to remain in that connection with God's Word, Holy Scripture, the authority of Scripture. We're also to remain in the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Verse 20, he said, you have an anointing from the Holy One and all of you know the truth. When we come to faith in Christ, and I think this is what John is getting at, when we come to faith in Christ, enter into a personal relationship, 
with God through faith in Christ, it tells us that the Holy Spirit indwells us. Ephesians 1 and verse 13 says, you have been uh, given a deposit that guarantees what is to come, and that's the Holy Spirit, the deposit that guarantees who we are. Paul then says in uh, Romans 8 verse 16 that the Holy Spirit reminds us that we are children of God. So that's one of the ministries of the Holy Spirit, reminding us that we belong to God. And the Holy Spirit teaches us. The Holy Spirit reminds us of the truth we've read and heard and learned. The Holy Spirit illuminates God's word to our hearts so we might better apply it to our lives uh, and our conduct. So the word and the spirit have to be held in balance. And here's an interesting quote from, again, from John Stott. He says, some honor the word and neglect the spirit who alone can interpret it. Others honor the spirit, but neglect the word out of which he teaches. So there's a balance. We can't neglect the teaching of Holy Scripture. We can't neglect the ministry of the Holy Spirit. We must, you know, be focused on both of them at the same time. So that because they truly complement each other, as, as Stott says here in this comment. And so the endurance of fellowship with God will be remaining in him, connected to him through his word and the message and through the Holy Spirit's anointing. And so we endure as we stay connected to Holy Scripture and as we stay connected to, um, to the Holy Spirit's anointing. 1 John 2, 28 says, And now, dear children, continue in him. And so he's talking about endurance. Continue in him so that when he appears, we may be confident and unashamed before him at his coming. Continue in him. Remain in him. And that's the endurance of our fellowship with God. So John seemed to be saying that if we are truly a follower of Jesus Christ, and have fellowship with God, our lives will look a certain way. We will have the ethic of fellowship, which is love for God, obedience to God, reflected in our love for others. We will manifest the evidence of the kingdom of God, our love and loyalty to God while resisting the temptation of this world. And we will experience endurance as we remain connected to God through his word and through the Holy Spirit. Father, we thank you for your word and just the reminder of the importance of us manifesting the ethic of fellowship, of showing evidence of fellowship, and of enduring in our relationship with you by maintaining our connection with you through your word and through your Holy Spirit. I pray that you would help us always to reflect our fellowship of you in our world and to be salt and light in the world that you have placed us in for your glory. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us as we sing.
to him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and great joy. To the only wise be glory, dominion, and power and Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. You may be seated. Uh, next Saturday, ladies, there's going to be a packing party right here. That's a party I'm going to probably miss for obvious reasons. Um, next Sunday, Saturday, 8, 9.30, right back here, you're packing the bags for Carolyn's Place for the expectant mothers who will be going to the hospital so they have the, the bag to take with them. Correct, Carol? Did I miss anything? Ah, oh, see? See what... Okay. Wow. Um, I printed more of those information cards. They're on the back table. If you guys are scooping those up, that's exciting. So um, keep scooping because I'll keep printing. Uh, there's a mowing list in the back if you'd like to participate in the lawn mowing. Well, we're more than welcome. We've had some rain, so I think the grass will be ready to mow here in a little bit. And there will be prayer time at the conclusion of the service right up front here. So um, if you'd like to be, have, be a part of that, just come on up. The chairs will be in a circle. You can participate in that. And uh, we would ask for others, the rest of us, to not interrupt them by uh, having loud conversations. So try to move our conversations further back in the room. And congratulations to Lucas Rosa, who graduated yesterday or this week. Was it yesterday? And, and your grandfather was bragging on you and said you got three awards. So congratulations, Lucas. Lucas is going to high school next year. Can you believe it? So These kids, they just keep growing up. What's that about? So God bless you all. Have a great week. Happy Father's Day to those.